Hi, welcome to Arguably. I'm Ross Anderson. And today, we're talking about politics. To some, that's the last thing you wanted to hear. Most conversations about politics are dumb, loud, and thoughtless. Partisans screaming at each other, repeating the same points over and over again. It's hard to learn anything new. Too many people are thinking far too often and far too poorly about politics. It really shouldn't consume your life. And that's precisely why, arguably, as a whole, will not be a political podcast. The next episode is on something completely apolitical, and it's just as good. On the other hand, because political conversations are so bad, I think I could provide something uniquely valuable when arguably does venture into politics, by having bigger conversations with nuanced, informed views on the important topics. My guest today is from the political right, but he's just as harsh a critic of the modern American conservative movement as anyone else. And perhaps most importantly, his thoughts and beliefs do not fit in narrow partisan binaries, and his interests go far beyond America's national boundaries. His name is David Frum. In the 2000s, he worked in George W. Bush's White House as a speechwriter, and has spent the years since working for think tanks, starting blogs, writing for national publications like National Review and The Daily Beast, before, in 2014, joining The Atlantic as a senior editor. There, he's written about the American conservative movement, becoming one of Trump's most outspoken critics in the process, and releasing a series of books connected to that. First, Trumpocracy in 2018, and Trumpocalypse in 2020. I'm not a fan of the titles, to be honest, but they're great books, and they're really interesting, thoughtful looks into the Trump White House. It's been said there's nothing new to learn about Trump, we all know everything. Well, David proves that wrong with these books. I highly recommend you give them a read. However, unlike some people, his thoughts go beyond Trump and go beyond politics. At The Atlantic, he's written about African art and the Mexican government, and a whole range of wide, interesting, different topics. And we get to dive into some of those two here, which I was chuffed about. I should also note that his wife, Danielle Crittenden, hosted a wonderful podcast, Femsplainers, which I deeply miss listening to. This is a great, more conversational episode of Arguably. But I think, no matter where you come from on the political spectrum, you'll get something to learn out of this, and you'll enjoy listening. Thank you again. David Frum, welcome to Arguably. Thank you so much. First question. How likely do you think it is that Trump will ultimately win the Republican primary or the general? I put money on him winning in 2016, winning the general, but I'm not convinced the odds are anywhere near the same again. He's more of a crank than he was then. His legal problems are pretty severe. And you can argue that Hillary lost in 2016, and Biden is a far more compelling candidate than Hillary. Well, very astute of you to have predicted in 2016, I have to say, I refuse to believe it. Partly, I have to admit, in retrospect, even at the time I would have said this to my intimates, as a matter of wish casting, I didn't want to face what it meant for my life and my beliefs if Trump won the Republican nomination. And then I didn't want to face what it would mean for America if and the world if Trump won the presidency. I remember very vividly the Sunday night before the Tuesday vote, my wife Danielle and I had dinner with Andrew Sullivan, a small dinner. And Andrew was in his bleakest, most apocalyptic mood and was just absolutely convinced that Trump would win. And I spent the evening talking him off the ledge. And I actually wrote something I still have on my phone about all the social forces that were out there against Trump, young people and women with French words on their cookware and, and that they would save us. And of course, Andrew was right and I was wrong. So that's the caveat for talking about 2024. I think the odds that Trump wins the Republican nomination are high, but, but not certain. A lot will depend on the timing of his legal troubles. I do believe they are deflating him slowly with Republican primary voters. How slowly depends on the pace of events. But still, you have to assume he is the likely winner, especially because no one else is trying to beat him. Everyone else is running for second place. No one's running for first place. None of the Republicans are. Not even DeSantis, who routinely proves himself afraid of Trump. And Republicans smell fear and don't like it. As for the general, I agree with you, though, that it's hard to imagine. Trump's or the Republican challenger's hope was that rising inflation would force the Federal Reserve or oblige the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates so high as to tip the country into recession. It looks like we're happily avoiding that fate. It's this summer of 23 and the US economy looks strong. If an election deciding recession is to begin, it has to begin within the next very few months. And it doesn't look like that's coming. And that's good news for the incumbent. So those are my predictions about the future, limited as they are, and with the caveat about how wrong I was in 2016. The legal one's interesting because 
the sort of Teflon Don syndrome, I think has people scared to predict anything. But the Georgia case looks pretty rock solid. My only trepidation is I don't necessarily think inflation is the big concern for Biden. Mine would be a health scare. I think that, that Trump doesn't seem old in the way that Biden does. Yeah. I think Trump loses if, you know, if Georgia is really bad. I think you're absolutely right, deflating attention. But I think if Biden has a serious health scare that makes much of the country worry for a 9-11 kind of event, what his leadership would be like, that unnerves me. Yeah. Well, when you say Teflon Don, there was a Twitter joke that circulated in 2015, 2016, 2017, LOL, nothing matters, meaning that Trump was impervious to events. I've never believed that. I believe that everything matters. It's just there's a lot of everything. And it's really important that people remember that Trump was never popular by presidential standards. I mean, obviously, he has an intense following. But if you look back to every election since the year 2000, presidential election, so there have now been six. 12 major party nominees, and you rank them by their share of the vote. The highest was Obama in 2008. The lowest was John McCain, also in 2008. 10th and 11th, second and third from the bottom, were Donald Trump in his two outings. Once he became president, there was never a single day when his approval rating in any reputable poll, not counting Rasmussen, in any reputable poll, hit 50%. He was a minority president every day of his presidency. And then he was hit by disaster after disaster. 2018, loss of the House of Representatives in the highest turnout election since before the First World War. 2020, loss of the presidency. And 2021, loss of the Senate. 2022, the best performance in an off-year election by the party of the president since the 1930s, if you look at state and federal elections. Biden and the Democrats won four state houses in 2022. You have to go back to the 1930s to see the party of the president making that kind of progress. They did lose the House of Representatives, but very narrowly picked up one in the Senate, two governorships. So Trump begins with these besetting weaknesses. I take your point about Biden's health. It is alarming. But if you think that the 2024 election is going to be a vote against more than a vote for, then the reasons to vote against Trump are the same whether Biden is in great shape or not so great shape. If Trump's legal problems do become quite severe, that deflationary effect in his popularity starts really taking effect and he stops being the default front runner and instead becomes reframed as a perpetual loser who essentially got lucky in 2016. Who do you think ends up coming to the front of the Republican primary? Everyone says DeSantis. I am not persuaded at all. Yeah, well, time's running out for a Tim Scott or a Brian Kemp. And as a would-be leader of a party, uh, there is an affirmative case that you have to make. In a general election, you can make a negative case. And that's what Biden made in 2020, which is, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. But a primary election is not a two-way choice. And so people need to make affirmative cases for themselves. And it has been staggering how Ron DeSantis has made the dumbest and worst possible case for himself. I mean, if you are on Breitbart in the comments six hours a day, he is singing your song. But to, to everybody else, I mean, it sounds like even if you sort of agree with him on some of these issues, they look small minded. The original case for DeSantis and the thing I wrote a piece in, I, I guess, 21 for The Atlantic about his chances. And what I, the case I assumed he would make was, which is during the pandemic, we had very little information. No one knew what was the right thing to do. Most states closed their schools. I opened the schools of Florida in August of of 2020. I didn't know. I had to make a guess. I had to rely on instinct and gut. And that was the right call. And it was not cost free. I'm not going to be blithe about the cost. The teachers were put at risk. And I'm sad about that. But we saved a generation of children in Florida. That's the case. You just say that over and over again. And then it goes to your judgment and your gut and your instinct and your priorities and also your ability to make hard calls, but showing compassion where necessary, compassionate to the teachers. But in the end, I had to save the kids. And instead, he's on this, these crazy, tiny little vendettas of interest to nobody except the most hardcore few. And and when he talks about what he did during COVID, he talks about the worst part. He surfaces his late arriving, stupid opposition to vaccines. And and by the way, the door he opened to not just COVID vaccine denial, but to true crackpots who, who want to bring back polio and measles. Instead of saying, I made a hard call, but it was the right call about the schools. Talk about the schools, that's where you live. And I think one of the things that's very hard for 
Republicans in general to remember and conservative Republicans in particular to remember is that the majority of the American electorate are women. So if you are talking to angry male, elderly, cranky Fox viewers who are mostly male, you are missing who the voters are. And the women do not appreciate these vendettas. They really don't, even if they sort of agree with you about some of them. In investing, sometimes weird stuff happens, like GameStop, for instance. But when it happens, there's not a presumption that therefore investing is over. The fundamentals are gone. But I think that's often treated the way in politics. Something happens, Trump happens, this has changed forever. Could it be that we're completely wrong on forecasting for the Republican primary? Could it be that someone like Asa Hutchinson, who, if you go back to the fundamentals, is the strongest candidate? Could that sort of candidate end up just sweeping right into the front? We revert back to normalcy because ultimately what matters is those round fundamental things that have lasted for 100 years before Trump. I wish that were true. And I have a lot of regard for Asa Hutchinson. I was in the George W. Bush administration when he was drug administrator. I had a chance to operate with him a little bit. He's a very judicious and thoughtful person. And one of the things I very much salute about him is as governor of Arkansas, the state where Walmart is headquartered, a major agricultural state, he has always understood that his state's prosperity and American prosperity depends on integration into world markets. And he is one of the few who still holds the flame for open trade. There's a book about Roman history called The Last Pagans of Rome, about the people who are still holding on to the old cults during the advent of Christianity. And I think there's a book to be written called The Last Free Traders of Washington, but he's one of them, and I salute him for that. Yes and no. So the fundamentals of politics are the fundamentals until they change. And I do think that one of the things that has happened, and not just in the United States, but around the developed world, is as societies become more prosperous, non-material aspects of politics become more and more important. So if you were voting in a country where men were allowed to vote in 1880 or 1890, you might trade your vote for a bag of coal, a turkey, maybe a government job. If you were casting your vote in 1950 in a developed country, you would trade your vote for a road or a bridge or a high school. But increasingly see today that voters don't seem to be motivated by non-material causes when they vote. So it's not surprising to me that as society changes, the fundamentals of the electoral system change. I mean, a lot of people talk about parties making decisions as if these were the old days where there were a handful of party leaders who could do it. So you'll get, why doesn't Biden change Kamala Harris or someone who pulled better? And the answer is, well, he can't. It doesn't work that way. It worked that way once upon a time. I can give you examples of when it did. I won't waste your time on the podcast now. But it doesn't work that way now. There, because hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, have an important say over these kinds of internal changes that once interested 6, 8, 20 people. So candidates have new kinds of constraints and therefore new kinds of behaviors. You mentioned the parties. Jonah Goldberg has long made a point that he attributes the sort of rise of Trump largely to a failure of Republican Party leadership, that they've got very weak. And he thinks that one of the ways to get back to a sane politics would be to sort of get rid of the primary system and get back the smoky rooms. I'm not necessarily persuaded. If I look to the current Republican leadership, I think you would end up just having Trump instantly chosen as the candidate without any contest. And the people to follow would be very much in his wake. What do you think? Am I wrong? Is Jonah right? Where do you think it comes out? I don't want to sound like a total technological and economic materialist, uh, because I'm not. But when certain kinds of changes come, you can only adapt to them. So you'll see an article that says, get cell phones out of the school. Really? You've got a technology that can fit inside a sock and you want to keep it out of the school. Good luck. Good luck. It's not doable. So in the same way, the reason the smoke-filled rooms worked when they did was because most people voted the way they shopped for well-known brands without a lot of information. And then there were a few people who had enormous power over the livelihoods of others in the political apparatus. So the mayor of Chicago could control the jobs of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And so when the mayor of Chicago went to the Democratic Convention, he was not speaking just on the radio and hoping that people would listen. There are people who would do what he said or he would fire them. And so these, you had these political organizations that were vast political machines with jobs to give and secret sources of money. If you were running for Congress in 1950, you didn't really raise your own money. 
somebody more powerful than you raised the money for you and gave you the money, and then you were beholden to them. That's not how it works anymore. Just after the Tea Party election in 2010, the then famous Tea Party Congresswoman Michelle Bachman had more money in her leadership pack than Speaker of the House John Boehner did. So whereas in 1950, a Speaker of the House could say to a wayward member, you know, you are ne- um, you keep quiet or you're never going to sit on an important committee. And by the way, we may drop you from the party list next time out. Well, those threats don't mean anything anymore. You can't go back to that. And the things you would have to unravel to go back to that world. We have to start from where we are. And I think there is just no avoiding the fact that a society becomes better educated, as systems of communication improve, there are more people who are going to participate in politics. And they are participating in politics for non-material reasons. If someone gives $100,000 to a politician, that may be corrupt, but that person is a rational actor. He knows why he's giving the $100,000, he knows what he expects, he's got, and he's got probably reasonably limited goals. But when somebody gives $50 to a politician, they are doing that as an expression of identity. And they don't very much care about external reality. And so that's why, and Democrats have this problem, especially of piling up huge sums of money in hopeless campaigns because the person somehow makes them feel good. Or the tens of millions of dollars that were raised by Michelle Bachman in the 2010 cycle. Most non-political people think that when you run for president, you're doing so because you want to become president. That really isn't so for many people. Nikki Haley obviously doesn't think that she's going to be president. She's running to be vice president. Vivek Ramaswamy is not running to be president. Sherrod Brown is in his state of Ohio in his vulnerable seat. So it looks like this is just a PR run for a Senate run, or he just wants a Fox show on Sundays. So who do you think in this current cycle actually wants to be president? And is there any way that we can put aside and incentivize people who actually want to do the job that they are extensively interviewing for. I do think this is a place where you have to focus a little bit more on the voters. And maybe this is the reason why the 24 election is so important, is that Republican voters have really not got the message. Everything you've been doing since 2008 is wrong. You're a regional party, you're a factional party, you're an ideological party, you're a non-majoritarian party. But because of the unrepresentative qualities in the American political system, there have been enough successes since 2008 that Republicans can talk themselves into the belief, and because we all now live more isolated from each other, that what they're doing is working. And none of their many defeats have been decisive enough to persuade them that what they're doing is not working. So they need an election which helps Republicans understand it's not working. 2004 was the last time the Republicans won a majority of the vote. So that means to qualify to be 18 in 2004, you would be 36 in 2024, at least 36. So you have to be 36 to remember an election in which the Republicans won a majority of the vote or won more votes than the Democrats did. And you have to be in your 50s to remember two such elections because the last one before 2004 was 1988. Now that's easy not to see. And and Republicans, when Trump kept talking about his historic victory, his enormous victory, and many Republicans chose to believe it And because of the media fascination with the Republican base, because they're located in ways that are more powerful geographically than the location of the Democrat vote, because the Republican base is bigger than the Democratic base, even though the Republican coalition is smaller than the Democratic coalition, uh, you have uh, uh, illusions. And maybe it starts not with candidates. Like, why is Vivek Ramaswamy doing this? Because the incentives are there that make sense. Why is he running a campaign where he is not talking about anything of interest to 95% of the population. Well, because that 5% is enough for his ends. That 5% needs to understand what we are doing here is self-destructive. And until they have got that message, and in politics, we often learn through pain, until they've got the message. The problem with the incentives facing the Republican voter, one, they are deceived about how strong they are. And two, the Democrats they've been getting have been pretty acceptable. Why sacrifice what you really believe if the punishment for voting your conscience is the Biden presidency? which whatever they say on Twitter is not that unacceptable. This isn't communism in the United States, no? I don't believe there's anyone who seriously thinks that. I really don't. If they did, they would sink their differences. I mean, those of us who felt that Trump was a real threat, I would have voted for Bernie Sanders against Donald Trump. And I cannot tell you how much I disagree and fear 
everything Bernie Sanders would do, but I fear it a lot. That's what you do when you confront an existential threat. If voters, if Republican voters thought that Biden was an existential threat, they would be uniting around the blandest, most generally appealing, most acceptable candidate. The fact that they say, you know, Trump is my first choice, that tells me they don't fear Biden. Britain had its own strain of populism, and it spouted from quite similar origins as Trumpism in terms of concerns about economic stagnation, concerns about immigration, concerns about sort of increasing globalism and the decline of the country. And yet in Britain, the Conservative Party has remained largely moderate. We have a competent, intelligent leader at the moment. UKIP and other sort of populist groups are non-existent at this point. And the Conservative voting public still support free trade, free markets broadly. Why do you think the Republican Party in the US is so different in this regard? Well, because Britain's a perfect example of what I was saying just a moment ago. Conservatives there really do fear a labor victory. They don't fear every labor leader necessarily, and Keir Starmer may seem broadly acceptable, but they fear the Labor Party. Because they fear the Labor Party, they behave in pragmatic, power-seeking ways. And even though Britain is not exactly a two-party system, conservative voters know it is effectively a binary choice, and they better make sure that their version of the choice is acceptable. And as you say, there is populism. But it's different. I think the Brexit vote looked a lot like the Trump vote. But the Brexit decision was not the same as the Trump decision. I opposed Brexit. I was in Britain at the time of that vote. I was then the chair of a leading British conservative think tank. And most of our people probably were for Brexit. And I was strongly against it. I thought it was economically unwise. But there is nothing good to be said about Trump except obliquely and indirectly and uh, as some kind of purgative of other things. But in himself, he's just appalling in every respect. There was something to be said for Brexit. I remember very vividly a conversation with a pro-Brexit friend of mine, a very intelligent and thoughtful person. And we went for a long walk in the part of the English countryside where he lived. And we got onto a ridge and he pointed out the lay of the fields below us and in their strange, irregular shapes. Very pleasing, but very startling to a North American eye. And he said, those fields in this part of the country were laid out after the Black Death. Boundaries date back to the 1300s, 1400s. He said, this island is old. We've governed ourselves for a very long time. We're good at it. And we've paid a high price to keep governing ourselves, and we'll pay a high price in the future to keep governing ourselves. To which I said, you know what? I can't argue with that. Just so long as you tell people it's a price. Just let them all know that you're all going to be five, eight percent poorer than you otherwise would be. That's not the end of the world. But don't tell them they're going to be richer. Don't tell them there's going to be more money for the NHS. Don't tell them there are going to be fewer immigrants. Those are lies. But if you tell them this is about self-government and national independence, and it's going to be expensive, but it's going to be worth it, if that's your argument, take your chances. Unfortunately, that was not the argument. And had that, my friend's argument would not have prevailed. <laughs> the truth was not what people voted for. They voted for the fiction. And the fiction has been painful. The positive Jacob Rees-Mogg proposition for Brexit was that Britain could resemble Singapore, but the hypothetical possibility was what people were voting for. Simply doing the thing would not guarantee that, and there were a lot more likely outcomes than a Singapore. Well, that was just delusional. My plan for success in a post-European future is that we do things that no British voter has voted for since the age of Gladstone, and no British voter ever will vote for, ever again. But if we do those things, then we can survive. But the Rees-Mogg example is this, is Brexit was sold as a promise of more when it meant less. It meant less resources for whether you prefer public consumption or private consumption. There was going to be less. And, and Rees-Mogg said, if we have a lot less for public consumption, then there won't be so much less for private consumption. But there's still going to be less. That was the choice British voters needed to make. It meant less material, th less material benefit for greater national independence. That's your choice. And had British voters understood that choice, they would, they would have said, you know, in that case, actually, <laughs> we like material abundance. We like more resources for private consumption and also more resources for public consumption. And, and therefore, having our food labeling reviewed by a bureaucrat in Brussels, that's not so painful. While the vote looked the same, the issue was not. But in Britain, people do have strong affirmative political loyalties, and that makes them more responsible in their political choices. One of the big differences that I noticed too between the, the US, which is where I do all my writing for, and the UK where I'm from, is our media landscape, 
particularly on television. In the United States, you have a range of privatized companies that seem all to be screaming from various different perspectives. Whereas Britain has a publicly funded broadcaster, which has a lot of trust, though it does have problems. Is news media sort of a market failure? And you can only get a roundly trusted, quite moderate programming if it comes from publicly funding and doesn't have that financial sort of capitalist incentive behind it. So I'm over 60. I grew up in a world in which the media meant a few gate-kept major institutions, CBS Evening News, The New York Times, later CNN. And many people talk about the media as if that's still true. The most important media company in the United States is Facebook, followed by YouTube as owned by Google. Reddit is more powerful than CBS. So when we talk about the media landscape, we need to talk about the media landscape as it is, not as it was in 1972. So it's the things that are forming people's mentality are these new media. And if there's lack of trust, it's an example of Chesterton said, when man loses his faith in God, he doesn't believe nothing. He believes anything. So when people have ceased believing in the marquee media institutions, they're gullible. They will believe any bullshit. They will believe that the Woolworth building was built by space aliens. Literally, that is a thing you will see on Facebook. And I actually have a re relative who's prone to that particular theory. There are crazy things that people will believe. And in a way, the internet has made possible a kind of semi-knowledge that is more dangerous than all. I mean, if I go to my doctor and my doctor takes my blood pressure and says, I'm not loving it. I want you to take this pill every day to lower your blood pressure. And he gives me the pill and I take, I, mean, I don't have high blood pressure, but hypothetically I take the pill. Six months later, I can return to the doctor and the doctor and said, yep, it worked. This is the right pill. You keep taking it. I probably have only the haziest idea what's in that, that pill. But if I don't believe that blood is real, I am going to go on the internet and I'm going to know so much about blood, but it's not real knowledge. It's half knowledge. It's not expert knowledge. It's credulous knowledge. It's the pretense of knowledge, as Hayek called it. The great problem is not skepticism, but gullibility. How do we build a healthier news media ecosystem then where there is better trust? Some of the established institutions have really converted very well to the online environment. The New York Times has done an excellent job, The Atlantic, as well as new publications like Airmail and Tablets and The Dispatch, I think all do a very good job. But still, I am always very conscious that I essentially work in stamp collecting. Yeah. Even at a place like The Atlantic, your average Joe probably isn't reading. Yeah. How do we get to a place where the average Joe, through their feeds, gets a higher quality of information and learns to fight off that gullibility? I think this may be a case, as with the voters, where we have to look at the consumers, not the suppliers. In, in 2016, the most circulated fake news story of that election was a story that claimed that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. It appeared in some really weirdo sites in the spring of 2016, and then it vanished for a time and then reappeared. Somebody put together, at the time this was popular, you would create something that looked like a local TV site, you know, WKRP Cincinnati, and it, there is no such thing actually. And knowing that the voters, the older, more credulous voters you wanted, the thing they still believed in was local TV, you made it look like a local TV news site. So there was the story of the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. Now, if you thought about it, I'm not a Catholic, and I'm not swayed by the Pope's endorsement. But if I were, if I were Catholic enough to be swayed by the Pope's endorsement, I would know first that this particular Pope had quarreled with Donald Trump and hated him and was not going to endorse him. And then I would also probably know that no Pope ever has endorsed a candidate for American president, not John F. Kennedy, not Al Smith, not the first Catholic, none of them were endorsed by the Pope. So it was improbable. And at some level, the people who repeated the story and cared about it had to know that. But they chose not to. So a lot of our credulity is a choice. When people believe the dumb things they believe, they, they, they want to. So what is going to make a, a difference, I think, is new generations of media consumers who have better understanding. And who, by the way, seeing their older relatives go, go crazy. And no, they don't want to be that lunatic uncle at the Thanksgiving table telling everybody the Woolworth building was built by space aliens. So we're going to have to adjust. You can't say we need to go back to some different, some previous time and find solutions there. Because even if there are ideals and principles that are endure across time, circumstances just change. One of the things that has made British conservatism so powerful is its willingness to adapt to changing circumstances. 
And one of the defects of American conservatism has been that rather than adapt, it is thought whether this is conservative Democrats in the 19th century, whether this is conservative Republicans in the 1930s, whether it's the modern Trump world, they tried to shut down constitutional political processes rather than adapt to changing circumstances as the British conservatives have so successfully done through 200 years. Yeah, it's striking that Rishi Sunak is leading the world in $100 million AI fund that's now looking into it. And we now have sort of a version of DARPA, essentially, that started for rapid innovation. Mm -hmm. You would not see a candidate running in the Republican Party who's pushing ideas like that. I mean, the closest you get is Vivek Ramaswamy's calls to missile strike Mexico's drug dealers. Right. Well, that's... Look, that's an, that is something that is so facially moronic. And Ramaswamy is obviously not, I mean, he's a fascinating, he's, he's obviously not a moron. So why is everything out of his mouth sound so moronic? And the answer is, well, because he has complete contempt for the Republican mm -hmm. voter. His lack of regard for them is so overwhelming. And so you think, you know, what is the thing they would say, uh, why don't we start an air war in Mexico and see how that goes? It's odd to me, simultaneously, I don't want to give Ramaswamy's campaign more attention than it deserves, but I think it ends up being an interesting sort of synecdoche for a lot of other problems. He often calls for either defunding or reevaluating funding towards our support for Ukraine and the American support for Ukraine, and yet has also said that we should be giving out AR-15s to Taiwan citizens. Well, Ukraine has become an important issue in the Republican Party for a shallow reason and maybe a deeper reason. The shallow reason is American voters tend not to vote on foreign policy issues in large numbers, rare exceptions, but generally no. Hmm. What they do vote for is identification with leaders and cultural figures. So thanks to Donald Trump and his vast morass of corrupt overseas connections, a lot of people who are Trump loyal have processed the idea that Ukraine is not our friend because Ukraine was not Donald Trump's friend, that Ukraine did not go along when Donald Trump tried to blackmail them in 2019 in a way that Zelensky's deft treatment of Trump was where he never said no to Trump, but never said yes either, as Trump tried to blackmail him to participate in the 2020 election for Trump's benefit, fabricate evidence for him. That led to the first impeachment of Donald Trump. So they've internalized this idea, if you love Trump, you must hate Ukraine. And lots of people have followed that path. I don't believe Lauren Boebert cares about mm. Ukraine. And if Trump were to tomorrow wake up and say, I've changed my mind, Ukraine is the greatest, all in for Ukraine, most of the Boeberts of this world would, and the Matt Gateses and the others would pivot. But there is a hardcore of Republicans who, in their way, see in Ukraine the same things that the small numbers of us who care passionately in favor of Ukraine see, which is this really is a test case for the power of liberal democracy against these new kinds of reactionary authoritarianism on the planet. And if Ukraine prevails, that's a win not just for Ukraine, but it's a win for the European Union. It's a win for the transatlantic alliance. It's a win for liberal democratic ideas. It's a win for, yes, the American national security state that these people say they hate mm -hmm. so much. It's a win for the Pentagon. It's a win for the FBI. It's a win for all those institutions they now hate. And if Ukraine loses, it's a defeat for them. And those are the stakes that we're playing for. I think there are a small handful of really ideologically committed Republicans who, who get what Ukraine's about and feel strongly about it and wouldn't change their mind if Donald Trump did. Zelensky is probably the most interesting leader on the planet at the moment because he was a comedian who then played the role of a president, then ran for president and is now a sort of Churchillian figure. And it's interesting, particularly with contrast with Donald Trump, the other most famous non-politician to become a leader of a country. Do you think we should not learn the wrong mistake from Trump and that non-politicians can actually be quite good in the system, particularly as the president should only be an approval role and much of the power should be in the legislature? Or is Zelensky a particularly remarkable outlier? Yeah. Did you ever watch his show? I have not. My mother and sister did. It's worth watching to understand who and what he is, because Zelensky, as you say, was a comedian. But in the three seasons of that show, he never tells, I, I recall right, I don't think he ever tells a joke. It's a funny show, and there's a lot of situational comedy about him. But the role he plays is that of the one honest man, surrounded by and horrified by corruption, including within his own family. When he wins by accident the presidency, his family immediately have plans to cash in. And he is horrified. And what he does is he identifies himself with the aspirations of regular Ukrainians for a normal country. 
And his great goal as president in this fiction is to take Ukraine into the European Union. And his vision is of a normal life with normal leaders who take the subway to work, ride a bicycle, do everything that a Dutch prime minister would do or a Norwegian prime minister would do. What he did was he was able to give people a visual image of the kind of president he'd be. Now, in more normal times, he might have been defeated by the system because it turns out knowing how your job works is really an important asset to the job. And so those American presidents who, have been, who are non-politicians who have been successful, Dwight Eisenhower being the outstanding example, have understood bureaucracy very well. He moved from the military side of the bureaucracy to the civilian, but he understood government. But in general, it hasn't worked. And even somebody like Herbert Hoover, who was, I mean, no one knew how to run a big organization more than him. Herbert Hoover. I don't think people understood what a colossal figure he was in the world of the 1920s. Herbert Hoover invented humanitarian assistance. The idea that you could, on a large scale, feed people in a war zone, no, no one had ever thought that such a thing could be done. And he not only thought to do it, but he did it. First in Belgium, then in Russia, and Russia in what we would now call Ukraine. And then as Secretary of Commerce, he organized the largest domestic disaster relief after a terrible hurricane in the 1920s. No one, again, no one had ever thought that it was a federal responsibility to take care of hurricane victims. He, as Secretary of Commerce, with no real right to do it, organized hurricane relief. And yet he never understood, okay, it's not just an administrative job, it's also a communications job. It's also an empathetic job. So when there's some catastrophe that is too big for you, you at least have to be able to communicate solidarity and fellow feeling with your citizens. And that was part of the job that defeated him during the Great Depression. So I think generally it's a good idea to play in the minor leagues before you go <laughs> to the pros. There will always be the Eisenhower exceptions, but I'm not sure I would really call Eisenhower a non-politician. Turning back to Trump, unfortunately, as so many things do, one thing that's very interesting is that when we look to the news media, Trump should be the perfect candidate in terms of handling. He is extremely easy to denounce. He says crap constantly. You know, you're not getting into a complex argument about policies that assist with inflation. You're talking about no, Ted Cruz's father did not assassinate JFK. And it's great rating space. And yet, throughout his presidency and before it, the handling of Trump was pretty damn terrible. I'm curious what you think the main lessons are, and how should the press handle Trump? I think Jonathan Swan's interview is probably the highlight of how to do it. I think in general with the modern media, there's not a lot of point in worrying too much about how to do your job. Because there's so many of you doing so many different things. You should just do your job the way you think you should do your job. And the consumers will tell you what they need. So, I mean, specifically, how do you interview Trump? Yeah, jo Jonathan Swan got it. So did Brett Baer. I mean, the CNN made such an obvious bonehead decision. If you're going to interview Trump, you do not bring in a braying mob of his most intense supporters so that your novice interviewer is overwhelmed by the noise in this vast room. That's obviously not a good idea. And that interview was lost not on the stage, but in the negotiating room, where CNN, for its own reasons, never said no to things that they should have said no to. And then they set up conditions for failure that no one could have coped with. But most of the time, the way you deal with Trump is you just report the truth. You just keep digging. And sometimes the truth will land and sometimes it won't. I mean, the New York Times in 2018 produced this vast investigation that proved outside the statute of limitations, it could no longer be prosecuted, but that Trump and his family had been engaged in massive large scale tax fraud on hundreds of millions of dollars scale. And they used the word fraud in the article as if to dare Trump to sue them for libel. So it was conclusive. He never did. But the story didn't land. And Americans have not really processed that Trump owes his fortune to a great extent to multi-generational tax fraud in which his father was as guilty as he was and was able to disinherit some of the Trump children to Trump's benefit and bail out Trump from his record of catastrophically stupid business decisions by you know, family money. That just never landed. But is that wrong? Should you not have done that? Should the Times not have made the resources available for the team of reporters to spend a year reporting? No, they should. They, you don't know how it's going to turn out. You just have to do your job. The CNN, I totally agree with you. The choice of crowd was perplexing, would be the charitable way to put it. But I also think that there was a problem in the questioning, namely that the questions were asked from the left. 
if you're doing a town hall with a Republican candidate, asking the consequences of Roe v. Wade, when the vast majority of your base, including the women in your base, support the overturning of Roe v. Wade, strikes me as being an odd choice. I think at this point it's pretty clear that while Republicans and Republican women thought they wanted the overturn of Roe v. Wade, that when they actually confront what that will mean, they don't like it much better than anybody else. That an effective regime of abortion suppression demands a level of surveillance and control of women of reproductive age that I don't think people had reckoned with. And I think for a lot of Republicans, pro-life was a purely hortatory position. It was a chance to scold. And I have been on the conservative side. I have long been opposed to Roe v. Wade, while I actually am personally in favor of abortion rights. Because this is turning out sort of the way I thought it would, and in a way that maybe is painful now, but for the ultimate good, which is overturn it, let voters taste it, let them see what it means, and let them then elect state governments that provide regimes they can live with. Because when you see what it means to have a real attempt to use the, the power of the state to control abortion, the levels of surveillance are going to be unacceptable. And and I think we are heading toward actually an abortion settlement. I've often compared it to the debate over alcohol prohibition. There's no question in the 19th century, Americans drank way too much. And it led to all kinds of terrible social ills. And it, something needed to be done. But the something that needed to be done was a collective consciousness change about the place of alcohol in life. And the attempt to turn that into statute backfired terribly. But out of that statute, the prohibition did change the way Americans consumed alcohol. And Americans in the 2020s drink a lot less than Americans did in the 1880s. And that's for the good. And in the same way, a pro-life policy looks like a collective consciousness change that makes, um, makes people think more about life in the womb. And by the way, it has succeeded. The number of abortions is in steady decline, even as the population grows. But the optimal number is not zero. And abortion should be declining because people make individual choices about what they value, and not because the state is surveilling and coercing individual women of reproductive age. I think an absolute majority of women who have abortions already have one child. And I think a large majority, if I remember this right, of women who have abortions, when asked why, explain economic uncertainty. Typically, they've lost a job, a relationship is broken up. If you want a mother's allowance, just say every baby you get $500 a month cash. That would have a big impact. That little bit of money at the margin would make a lot of difference in people's individual choices. It's not because they can't get contraception. It's because they have one child already. They're trying to provide for that child. The relationship is broken up. They're working hard. They're in their 20s. I can't cope with two. Well, what if we gave you $500 a month? Some of them say, in that case, yeah, then maybe I could. If you do most polling, the American view of abortion, the most common view, is very similar to that in Britain. Do you think that a future of the Republican Party could be that a candidate or candidates who simply try to orient towards popular positions? You mentioned earlier about with COVID, the educational loss over COVID was probably the biggest motivating issue for voters. They affected so many families. These are the most active and politically engaged people. Do you think that, that would be a healthier direction and one that in the long term would prove more fruitful for the Republican Party to become a competitive party again? I think for all of us, when we're dealing with the things we regard as social ills, we should think not how do we ban, although some bans are sometimes necessary, but how do we encourage? I think it would be much more fruitful if you were a party of life to say, what we want to do is create a positive culture to have, mm -hmm. to have children in which people feel like they can do it. I'm not a drug legalizer by any means. There are a lot of reasons why you want drugs to be illegal, not least that when someone's in real trouble with the law, the illegality of the drug gives the judge in that person's case, people to say, look, if you go into a treatment program, I will mitigate mm -hmm. your punishment for driving under the influence or, or whatever petty crime. You, you, know, you, you robbed a bank in order to get money for your drug habit. If you go into the treatment program, I will reduce your sentence. So the illegality is powerful because you couldn't do that if the drug is legal. That said, if we're going to reduce these fentanyl deaths, we're not going to do it by bans. We're going to have to think in a completely different way about why do people risk their lives in this way? What's wrong that so many people do it? How do you reach people? How do you offer them lives of more meaning so they don't want to? So they say, I've got something to live for. So I just generally think and the older I get, the more strongly I believe this, that when you're saying, how do we police? You're asking the wrong question.
when I think about the big questions of American life, I, think, I mean, there's so much that is thrilling and exciting and admirable and even uniquely admirable about the American way of life. It's dynamism, it's creativity, it's entrepreneurship. The, the sense of confidence it gives ordinary people where, where people can say, I, you know, you can't do that to me. I'm an American. I have rights. I know my rights. I mean, that is a wonderful spirit. And even other advanced democracies, people are a little bit more likely to eat their peas when their peas are put in front of them, whether they like peas or not. And that's certainly true in Britain. It's true of my native Canada. So there's a lot to admire. But it's also true that this is a system that is very hard on the lowest two-thirds, certainly the lowest third of the population, but even the lowest two-thirds. And people live with unnecessary anxieties and dreads. I mean, the medical system is one example, but there's so many others. And I just think we are overdue for some real rounds of creative reform to give more people the chance to lead a life that seems meaningful to them. And the politics I'm interested in is how do you do that? And I increasingly see that a lot of the most vexed things our problems on the way to solution as abortionists. I think we are on our way at last, having interrupted it for 50 years, to coming to a, an abortion consensus that America can live with. And it's going to proceed because of the kicking the Republican Party is going to take on the abortion issue. We saw that in 22. I think they're heading for another in 24. There may be more to come before politicians get the message, stop telling people what is going to be prohibited and start thinking about how natalism can be encouraged. And I think many other hot bit button issues, I see the same possibility. In one of Evelyn Waugh's war novels, there's a scene where two men are sitting on the beach sharing a bottle of wine, and one says to the other, if you were challenged to a duel, what would you do? And the man is asked, well, I'd say, don't be an ass. I would, <laughs> I would never do it. Right, right. But if we lived 150 years ago and someone challenged us for a duel, we'd have to do it. Well, I suppose. So there must have been some point in between when you didn't know. And I think a lot of life is about that. We are at a moment in between when we don't fight like like duels, that's dumb. But it's not yet something you can just refuse with dismissal and the person who asks you feels like a fool. There's a moment of uncertainty and, and we're at one of those. My biggest trepidation about looking into the future post the current party system is the Ross Perot problem. Which is in the 90s, you have a compelling third party who gets a lot of success, gets a large percentage of the vote. And what happens is the existing party ends up cannibalizing the new idea, take some of them, and status quo resumes. I see that with no labels at the moment. I don't believe in third parties at all. I mean, my, my response to every third party idea is Theodore Roosevelt, who was the most popular politician in American history to that point. He got in 1904 a larger share of the vote than Ulysses Grant got in either of his two elections, the man who saved, the general who saved the Union, certainly more of the vote than Lincoln got in 1860. So he was the most popular president ever to date in 1904. He tried a third party run and it didn't work. <laughs> so if someone who actually has been president for seven years and won the biggest landslide in history to that point, if he can't do it, you can't do it. And all, all that Ross Perot in retrospect told, tells me is that the Republican coalition that was dominant from 1968 to 1988 was about to crack apart. And Perot was the release of the more vociferous elements in the Republican Party. And that election was the last moment. 1988 was the last moment in which the Republican Party was the majority party at the presidential level. And he may have been both the cause, but also the symptom of the crack up of the Republican majority that has never been put back together again. But most third party runs are expressions of something. Most of the third parties in American history have been ways where something that was not captured by, like in the 19th century, the late 19th century is the golden age of, of third parties. And the, the basic problem then is after the end of the Civil War, the United States goes back on metallic money, gold and silver, at the pre war price level. And that means everybody's wages get squeezed and everybody's debts get boosted. And people are intensely unhappy about this. And the, neither of the two parties is really willing to engage with the great post-Civil War deflation. And so that energy goes to third parties that offer one or another more or less intelligent solution to that problem. And it keeps going until in 1896, you get William Jennings Bryan saying maybe the answer is non-metallic money. And he identifies the Democrats now with that cause. 
most of the time, the Republicans are now the dominant party again from 1896 to 1928. But the Democrats have identified a resource. We need to break the back of chronic deflation. We are the anti-deflation party. And that then is the foundation of their success in the Great Depression, the worst deflationary experience yet. And there are the prohibition parties and women's suffrage parties and abolition parties. They're talking about something outside the party system. So when you're looking at third parties today, say, what's not being talked about? No Labels has this poll, and I should say they're friends of mine. I have spoken at their events. I admire and like many of the people involved, but they don't have an issue. And they have this poll that says, which do you prefer, Biden, Trump, or a moderate independent? That's like me asking you, what would you like for dinner? Chicken, fish, or something you'd like better? I don't know. I like chicken. I don't like fish. But something I'd like better, yeah. And then I say, okay, well, the something you'd like better is tofu. Well, no, no. In that case, I'll have the chicken. <laughs> but obviously, I mean, I'm amazed that they didn't get more people like Trump, Biden, or somebody I'd like better. You know, I think I'm going with somebody I'd like better. So worryingly low results for somebody I'd like better for only, what was it, like 47% or something like that? Yeah, well, because there's a lot of people thinking, I bet it's tofu. <laughs> I don't think I'm getting something I like better than chicken or fish. I think it's probably going to be tofu. If we look back to the 19th century and, and think about it with the modern Republican Party, what do you think is the crisis that could force this thing into changing and evolving and becoming something new? Is it sort of a 10-year late acknowledgement of the 2012 autopsy and they go, actually, that was kind of right and we are just having catastrophic losses we need to change? Or is it going to be a national economic factor? When you've had these shocks, it tends to be something you cannot predict. Where are the moments when the American party system has really been reshaped? Through the first half of the 19th century, the Democrats are the dominant party, the Whigs are the weaker party. Dred Scott wrecks the Whigs, but also challenges the Democrats, and the cards get reshuffled and eventually get the Republican Party as a challenger. Then after the Civil War, the Republicans make the fateful decision to go back on gold and silver at pre-war prices. It caused this 25-year depression. With their moments when the economy improves, but basically down, endless downward pressure on wages, endless upward pressure on debts. And the shock there is massive gold discoveries in the late 1890s in Australia and South Africa and Canada that make the gold system less oppressive to ordinary people and make the Republican Party who had defended gold look good. And they then become the dominant power party until the Great Depression. That makes the Democrats the dominant par party until the great crime wave of the 1960s and 70s. That makes the Republicans the dominant party until the end of the Cold War. The system since the end of the Cold War has looked a lot like the 1880s. You have a string from 1876 to 1896 where you have five elections in a row where neither party clears 50% of the vote. And the period from the end of the Cold War to now looks like that. But I think Trump is recasting the party system. So what you're basically seeing is people with more education moving into the Democratic coalition and more recent immigrants moving into the Republican coalition. The people with, with more edu are attracted by the Democrats' more liberal social values. The more recent immigrants are confronting the negative consequences, higher crime, urban disorder of those liberal social values and are moving to the Republicans in rejection. And we'll see how that works itself out. I thought Trump would be the massive shock. He's been a shock, but not a big enough one to really recast. But I think it's going to look different. And I think one of the things the Democrats don't understand is that their message is not very attractive to the most recent immigrants of this country. And they think it should be because that they celebrate the most recent immigrants. But the most recent immigrants themselves say what we want are vagrants off the streets, cops on the beat, and we want safety in our shops and places of business. You had a, you had a famous tweet where you said something to the effect of, if liberals don't enforce borders, fascists will. People want security, and most people can't afford to provide that security for themselves, so they want the state to do it for them. And if the state won't, they will get someone who will. Off to the break, quick questions with David Frum. Quick questions. First, what's the biggest misconception about working in the White House? <laughs> Gosh. Well, I don't know if this is still true. The biggest misconception that I confronted was the idea that the White House is buzzing with the most advanced technology. When I was there, there was a popular show, The West Wing, and it, the White House in the West Wing was just such a gleaming place. And meanwhile, when I was there, 
it was only the president's personal secretary who had a flat screen computer monitor and everybody else at a time when flat screen computer monitors were ubiquitous in private offices we all had the last of those big bulky pc monitors we had pagers when other people had already got cell phones so that was one this may be different for the military people but on the civilian side it was always you were dealing with the technology of five years before would america be a more healthy country if it were more religious or is the religious intensity of politics responsible for this problem? If America were more religious in the way the founders of religion want religion, if America and Americans worked harder to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, that would be better. If religion means sectarianism and thinking yourself better than your neighbor and persecuting, then obviously it's bad. What did you think of the film Vice? I didn't watch it. I watched the trailer and was struck by the uncanniness of the impersonation of Dick Cheney. But I'll tell you, if the premise of your movie is that George Bush was a weak-minded person, then you've got a bad premise. What Cheney's power in the first Bush term came out is George W. Bush revered his father, um, thought his father had been a great president, and, had, and thought his father's presidency had been doomed because the father overemphasized foreign policy at the expense of domestic policy in the first term. And he was determined not to repeat that mistake. So his plan for his first term was that the presidency would be about education, healthcare, certain kinds of cultural issues, restoring cultural responsibilities, he often said, and then he would delegate a lot of the foreign policy work, most of which he believed could be postponed until the second term to a vice president with great foreign policy expertise who would keep things quiet while he worked on the domestic portfolio. 9-11 upset all of those expectations. Oh, he also thought his most important foreign policy issue was going to be consolidating democracy in Mexico because Mexico had a democratic transition in the 1990s and 2000 that he was very excited about. And that for him was the thing he was going to do Mexico. The other portfolios would be left to Cheney and then it'd be quiet until the second term when he would pay more attention to foreign policy. That's the, that's the context for the power of Cheney in those early years. How will history remember Henry Kissinger? There's a fantastic book about Henry Kissinger that I strongly recommend to people people who want to denigrate him by Barry Guin called The Inevitability of Tragedy. Kissinger was formed by the experience of exile from his native Germany. He had a very dark view of the world. And as a result of that, he often misunderstood the world. And he often made dark choices when they weren't necessary. I don't entirely blame the United States for the overthrow of Salvador Allende in Chile in 73. But any American fingerprint on that was a disaster. Chile had had a working democratic system. The United States needed to support the democratic forces in Chile against Allende's authoritarian tendencies, but it should not have taken part in, in, and had anything to do with that terrible coup and the horrible atrocities that followed. Kissinger bet wrong on the Bangladesh war, where he supported Pakistan's terrible atrocities. That was really driven more by Nixon than by Kissinger, but Kissinger enabled it and didn't speak up. And there, there are other similar things. But he was a great intellect. He created the modern national security system. We can all learn from him. And I'm very averse to the modern Twitter system of morality where you assign people to categories of good and bad. And if you've assigned them to the bad categories, well, then there's nothing to be learned. If the choices were easy, they wouldn't have to be made by the people at the highest level of national power. I reiterate your recommendation of Farrah Guillen's book. It's fantastic. Who should hold the Ben and Bronzes? <laughs> Do we have an hour for this? Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So I wrote a big story for The Atlantic about these famous artworks from Africa. And I've got a sequel that is in the works that brings the story up to date, which I recommend to people. It will probably be out at about the same time as this podcast is released. So I hope people will go see that. This goes back to my belief about don't assign things to categories of good and bad and then say there's nothing to be learned. It's a hard problem. I think the solution I would recommend is it may be that someday they do go back to a Nigeria that can build proper museums and display them properly, but that Nigeria is not now. And these artworks are 400, 500 years old. There is nothing wrong with postponing decisions about them for another 30 or 40 years. Are you optimistic about the future of Mexico? Generally, I don't answer questions about optimism and pessimism because they imply a view of the future as something you can make statements about rather than something you can form. So, the future of Mexico is very much up for grabs right now. It's something I care a lot about. I've made my first trip to Mexico as a boy in 1966 or 67. I've been there 40 or 50. I don't speak the language, unfortunately, but I've been there a lot. I have friends there. And I think its potential is so at the tip of one's tongue, you can taste it. If the Mexican economy, from the time NAFTA was signed, 
1994 to now had grown at one quarter the pace of China's economy. Mexico today would be as wealthy as a Southern European state like Portugal or Italy. And if it had grown at half the pace, it would be as wealthy as the Southwestern or Southeastern United States. What would that world be like if you had a Mexico that was as easy a neighbor as Canada is? That would be a transformative thing. So we have to make that true. And so it's not something just to make a statement about. It's something we can, and Americans have limited ability to help, but to the extent they can, they should. And so when I hear people saying things like, well, what we need is to launch rockets in Mexico. I just, I mean, it's stupid on on its own face because, well, what happens when the people at whom you've shot the rockets, what happens if some of them survive and then strike back at you? You'll have cartel violence. They'll be blowing up car bombs in the streets of Houston. Is that a good solution? You want to reimport the kind of narcos terrorism you saw in Colombia into the United States? Because that's what you're asking for. But we can make it better. And I think the goal we should be working for is a Mexico that looks like Portugal and has the same standard of living and where Americans and Mexicans are comfortable with each other. Which country do you enjoy visiting the most? Oh, I do love visiting Mexico. I do. It's so endlessly interesting. Canada is my native land, so it doesn't exactly feel like a visit. And I've spent so much of my life reading and thinking about Britain that it too feels like home when I go there. Has the war in Ukraine strengthened or weakened the state of Europe? Enormously strengthened, and more strengthening is yet to come. Europe has discovered potentiality in itself. It's discovered that an instrument like the European Central Bank is a financial superpower. And when the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve cooperate with junior, with the Bank of England and the Bank of Japan as smaller but important partners too, the, the power of that is remarkable. And I think Ukraine has reminded Europeans that, look, the European Union is mostly boring and a lot of paperwork and a lot of administrative rigmarole. And it's just doesn't feel very romantic. And then you watch people fighting and dying for the right to be part of it. You say, you know what, Back back of it all, there is still something that can inspire people. In the spring of 2015, my son and I took a trip along the Western front line of the First World War. We started in Flanders and curved around the big semicircle and ended up at Verdun and then at the, and, and then beyond. And after two weeks of doing this trip, we got back in our car and we drove from the southeastern corner of France through Luxembourg, had lunch in Germany, drove into Belgium without a border stop, dropped off our rental car, got in the plane and flew home. And you think, there's something kind of inspiring about that last six hours, France, Luxembourg, Germany for lunch, Belgium, all won money, no border, no war, mutual understanding. That's pretty inspiring. And when you see how much people suffered a century ago for the lack of it, it's pretty inspiring to have it now. And if the Ukrainians can remind Europeans of today of that, then they will have earned every euro of the half trillion dollars of aid they're going to need to rebuild. What should Western countries do to support and strengthen Taiwan? I think one of the most important things that has been done is something that has happened already, is to make it clear that we don't abandon friends like Ukraine, even if they're not embedded in formal alliance structures. I also think we need to understand the limits of our goal. I mean, Taiwan and China are part of a cultural zone, and they are going to find ways of accommodation, one with another. And one of the things that has been true until recently about the Chinese political leadership is they are much better risk calculators than the Russian leaders have been. They are nasty pieces of work in their own way. Don't misunderstand that. But they just have been much more circumspect. And the goal of policy should be to encourage that circumspection and to say, no one says that someday these two entities may not be reunited if the people of Taiwan agree. And by the way, you could attract them. If China reforms in a more liberal way, Taiwan may be the first to say, yeah, we want in. But don't use violence because that is bad for everybody. Was Nixon wrong to open relations with China? No, he, of course he was right. And that goes back to your question about Henry Kissinger. He was right even though Mao Zedong was one of history's great monsters, even though he had recently overseen the largest man-made famine in the history of the world, leaving tens of millions of dead, even though he was presiding over the chaos and ruin of the Cultural Revolution. He was an atrocious figure, but they were right to do business with him. You have to be careful about the kind of business you do, but they were right. And one more time, tragedy is inevitable. Andrew Yang proposed that presidents should be paid far more, but be barred from earning income after office. Do you support this? I think that's a great idea. But even more, I would say, just generally, one of the things I hope the Supreme Court scandal teaches us is those guys need to be paid enough to pay for their own vacations 
and painted their own vacations that are not too dissimilar from the kinds of vacations that their classmates at law school are going on. So yeah, uh, I think the idea of paying a Supreme Court judge a million dollars a year for a fixed 19 year term, and then saying, once you come off the court, you get the same million dollar pension, but you may not do anything else for pay. You want to teach, you teach. You want to support causes, you want to be of counsel on a pro bono basis, fine. But you start having clients, you lose your pension. And that means that when you're on the court, you shouldn't be thinking about your future income stream. Now, we're going to guarantee you that. I think that's a good idea. Just generally, one of the big differences between the United States and peer democracies is the United States doesn't have a proper civil service. It doesn't have proper congressional staffs because people are so, at the upper ranges of these jobs, so horribly underpaid. Probably the top 5,000 jobs in the federal government should pay more than they do. And the Congress, the Senate, President, Supreme Court, Federal Reserve, the top people there should be paid a lot more than they are now. But with much stricter ethical rules and real pensions, but real limits on what you can do if you accept the pension. One more reform while I'm at it is that everyone who accepts secret service protection should publish their tax returns. It's astonishing to me that Trump put his children in jobs in the White House. We all thought that was illegal, probably is illegal, but if they accepted secret service protection, we want to see Jared and Ivanka's tax returns. Thank you very much. Is J.D. Vance completely insincere? I think it's very hard to be completely insincere for any human being, except maybe Iago. If the brain thinks one thing and the mouth says another, eventually those come in harmony for most people. Conscious, sustained hypocrisy requires too much discipline. So eventually the brain starts to believe the things that the mouth says. But will J.D. Vance change? Yes. I knew him well, as the premise of your question at one point. I wouldn't say we were friends, but we were friendly. He published on my website under a pseudonym, which I honored until he himself broke that pseudonym. I have a lot of respect for him. I think he's a man of great gifts. I'm sorrow to see his present incarnation, but I don't think it's his last incarnation because I think circumstances will change and he will once again change with them. Why does Trump continue to support the vaccine, even though most of his base opposes it? I don't know. It may be because at some point, part of his brain recognizes it's about the only accomplishment he's got. It may be because, as Jonathan Chait said, Trump is a snob who hates his followers and he does and he understands that this is a stupid person thing to think and he doesn't want to look and sound like a stupid person. It may be because of his fears of disease and mortality. I remember someone who worked closely with Trump once said to me about him, he's totally alone and he's terrified of death. And Maybe that terror of death makes him unwilling to speak ill of modern medicine. I don't know. Why doesn't RFK Jr. run as a Republican? Because the people who are promoting and supporting him don't find that useful. He's obviously a person of strong will, but not a strong intellect. And I think he has been manipulated here and deployed for a particular purpose. I'm not sure it will work out. The people who are behind him are not geniuses either. I'm not sure it's going to work the way they want it to. His strength in the polls is all misplaced name recognition. I think, well, Democrats at some level know that RFK Jr. is not the same as RFK. They don't have that sorting out RFK Jr. and and JFK Jr., whom they liked, and JFK and RFK, it's, it's blurry. But it will all get better known, and his support in the Democratic primaries will collapse. And I don't know that anyone's going to be talking about him by this time, four months from now. Which contemporary politician would make the best president? Oh, Well, it depends what you mean by contemporary, but I still burn incense at the altar of Mitt Romney and man of character, intelligence, managerial ability. And I think he would have made a fantastic president. Was Chris Litch good for CNN? Obviously not, but I'm not sure that there's a solution to the problem of CNN. CNN's core problem is that it's got a business model that depends on viewership by people who turn on TV at fixed hours as their primary source of information about what is going on in the world. And that is a finite and dwindling resource of people. I mean, I'm pretty old. When something happens in the world, I don't have any impulse to turn on CNN to find out about it. Maybe if I were 10 years older, I never know, oh, it's seven o'clock. It must be time for whoever's on at seven o'clock. Don't watch TV that way. And that's their business model. So they are pulled to an older and older and therefore more and more conservative audience. And they can never outcompete that audience with Fox, because in the DNA of CNN is the belief the managers and producers are the stars, not the on-air talent. So their on-air talent is always a little wonder bready. And meanwhile, on Fox, they're serving spicy jalapeno poppers. And so the older audience 
wants the spicy jalapeno poppers and not the Wonder Bread. Will Tucker Carlson fade into obscurity? Yes. Yes. I think he was ultimately punished for believing that as much as Fox allows for more scope for on-air personality, his offense was thinking he was bigger than the brand. The brand sought to teach him otherwise, and I think they will succeed in teaching him otherwise. I also think he's going to discover, as so many people on these new platforms have discovered, is once you sign up for a platform where you're rewarded for intensive loyalty, for a few people watching hours and hours, you end up either being super specialized, you know, I'm sure gardening YouTubers are not crazy people. There are people on YouTube right now, hugely famous in the gardening world, and people watch all of their videos. So you either need a very niche specialty, or you talk to crazy people who feel themselves rightly not spoken to by mainstream media. And this is a thing you're going to have to worry about in this podcast, because many of the people who don't start off crazy in the podcast world become crazy because the audience who will listen to David Frum and you and blather on for hours and hours as we're doing, I hope they're not crazy, but the people who do that tend to have unusual views. I've made part of my professional career studying this, so I'm hoping to avoid it. This is a, an experiment to see if I go wild. You wrote the definitive article about Dave Rubin. I think I said about that. If Dave Rubin had been 30 years older, he would have been a very successful game show host. He's good looking. He's charming. He has natural appeal. He doesn't have strong beliefs of any kind. He just wants to be on TV and be liked. And he'd be right now clapping as people win refrigerators if he had been 30 years older. Instead, he's promoting vaccine denial and whatever crazy thing is on his mind. I don't know if he's yet at the Woolworth building was built by space aliens, but there are not a lot of barriers between him and that. I'll ask him, which top tier publication do you regularly read but think is underappreciated and underread? I'm a huge reader of the Financial Times. I don't know if it's underappreciated, but it tends to do not as well in the United States as the Wall Street Journal does. But the Wall Street Journal is so America focused and you need to be focused on the rest of the world. Do people appreciate The Atlantic enough? I don't think so. They should appreciate it more. I think also we all need to make more time in our lives for books. That may be the, the medium because there are just things, however exhaustive you are for journalism, there are a lot of things that take 800 words that could be tweets, but there are a lot of things that take 8,000 words that really would benefit from 80. Final three questions. What book would you recommend that most listeners will not have read or perhaps even have heard of? The book that has had probably the greatest enduring influence on my life and thinking, I'll give you two examples. So one are high level, one is low. Um, so I read as a young man, the novel cycle by Marcel Proust. It's not for everybody. The great thing about it is you only need to give it 50 pages and either you can't stop or you can't continue. Um, it's a good way to discover what is you. But what the novel is about is the way the mind works and the way the mind can deceive itself, the way the mind can discover things about itself that it might not otherwise have known. And then a book that I read as a boy that made a huge impact on me were the novels of Horatio Hornblower by C.S. Forrester. And in particular, there's one scene in one book that, God, I think about every day. So in one of the Hornblower novels. The young Hornblower is a teenager at this point. He's put in charge of a cargo of rice. The British ship has captured this cargo, and it's his job to get the cargo of rice into a British port. And it's the first time he's ever been in charge of anything. And they've been shooting at the thing, so it may have holes in it. So you have to take the soundings to see, is the boat taking on water? If he does the soundings and the boat is dry. He has forgotten to think the rice is absorbing the water. And so the boat steadily sinks, and his first command turns into total catastrophe. And then they are captured by a French ship he and his crew, and on the ship as a prisoner, he organizes an incredibly heroic and brave rescue. He's then brought up for reward for his heroic and brave rescue. And he's offered promotion and all kinds of things, but he knows the only reason that he was in a position to do the heroic and brave rescue was because of his own inexcusable prior fuck up. And in a world in which no one is going to know and no one does this, he insists that the heroic and brave rescue was an accident. He was just the beneficiary of luck. He refuses the reward because he knows he has avoided the punishment he deserves. So he cannot accept the reward that he only deserves because of the thing he's not going to be punished for. And I think about that story probably every day. Who is the most important person most listeners want to know about? The most important person on earth? However you want to take that question. That's an impossible question. The most important person to me or the most important person to the listener? I don't know that I can even cope with that question. I don't know that I can even cope with that question, but I would say if you want some answer that might be useful to people, intimate connections are the most important things in your life and go build them. Spouses, children, parents, friends. There's a line in a Robert Frost poem, a home is where when you go there, they have to take you in. 
you need that. And if you don't have that, go get it. Final question. Where can people find you and what are you currently working on? People can find me at The Atlantic. They can find me on Twitter. They can find me on this podcast. And what I'm currently working on, I've just finished. We're going through the copy editing, an update on my Benin Braun story. And I'm working on a stack of books here. My next story for The Atlantic, which is an update on a recent scholarship on Woodrow Wilson, who is one of the most reviled people and left right now, catastrophic collapse of reputation. And I'm going to talk about why that catastrophic collapse happened and whether it's fair and what we can do about it. And the last thing I'm working on, to put in a commercial for myself, is a memoir. Here's draft one that I'm going to review this summer, reread and decide whether it needs to be fixed, challenged, whether it should be, and decide whether it needs to be fixed, challenged, whether it should be published in my lifetime or afterwards. It's not a personal memoir. It's a lifetime in the conservative movement. And those are my projects. David Frum, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and family and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you really loved it, you can become a supporter at arguablypods.com. For just £5 a month or £50 a year, you'll get access to new episodes a week early, participate in our Q&A episodes, and join the comment section. You can follow the podcast at arguably underscore pod on Twitter or arguably pod on Instagram. And you follow myself everywhere where people are followed at, at that Ross chat. Thank you again.